The Apostle Peter was an amazing man, and we are able to identify with him in a variety of ways. Sometimes we talk when we should be listening, and I think that happened to Peter more than once. But on the other hand, sometimes we do manage to call for courage and act with courage, and Peter did that on occasion. And sometimes we stumble and fall flat on our spiritual face, and so did Peter. And he was forgiven and assured that he was still usable in the kingdom of God. In our first of these series, we looked at the call of Peter. In other words, when Jesus says, I want you to be a, an apostle and the things that had already happened, that caused Peter to think, here's a man to follow. Now I want to bring to your mind that Moses was also a lawgiver. Moses also was able to perform some amazing miracles as far as the people were concerned. But Moses kept saying, it's not me, it's God. You remember the ten plagues? Amazing things happened at the hand of Moses because God was working through him. So there's some question about who is this Jesus? Who is he really? Is he like Elijah, a prophet? Is he like Moses, a lawgiver? Is he able to perform amazing miracles? How high does our evaluation of this man go. And that's the direction of Peter's journey. Peter's journey began pretty much with the question, are we sure? And it grows from there. And of course the next thing that happened in the life of Peter that we talked about was the fact that he was in the boat the seas were rough, the wind was contrary, they were having a hard time rowing across to their destination. Jesus comes to them walking on the water, and when Peter sees that it's Jesus, Peter's the one who says, If it is you, Lord, command me to come to you. And Jesus said, Come. And he did. But he got to looking at the world around him, specifically the waves, the feeling of the wind, and he started to sink. And he cried out to the only obvious source of help, which would be Jesus Christ, and Jesus took him by the hand. Now, we're moving a step further down Peter's road. What happened between walking on the water and starting to sink and the big question that Jesus asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? And there's a number of events that happened between those two things. And we'll look briefly at those. There were a lot of miracles done at Gennesaret, the place where they landed when they got off the boat. And it says in Matthew 14, 35 and 36, as many as touched the hem of Jesus' garment were cured. And then there's a question about tradition and commandments. And Jesus is reprimanded because the apostles were seen eating without having washed their hands. And so the traditionalists, the Pharisees and the scribes, come to Jesus and say, how is it that you violate the tradition of our fathers? And so this gives Jesus the opportunity to teach the difference between traditions bound as if it's God's law and God's law itself. In fact, he says to those people, you are experts in setting aside the commandment of God. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. And so it continues in Mark 9 and in Matthew where it says, they would say, I cannot help my mother and my daddy because the money that I would help them with has been promised to God. Therefore, they used God as an excuse for not doing 
God's will. And Jesus says in Mark 7, verses 6 and 7, that they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Did you know that is basically a description of hypocrisy? A pretend Christian who really knows inside, I am not really trying. I am pretending, and it is to my advantage that I pretend. And then he gives a second thing that invalidates worship. He says, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. When churches start bringing something in that doesn't have book, chapter, and verse, that's exactly what this is. Amen. That's exactly what this is. You cannot bring traditions of men that don't have book, chapter, and verse into God's kingdom and it not make it vain and useless. Now, Peter's getting this. Peter's seeing all of those miracles at Gennesaret. He's, he's hearing Jesus talk about the significance. You can't keep the traditions. And so what Jesus is telling Peter is those traditions that the Jewish people have been observing for a long, long time are nothing but traditions. And they make worship to God worthless. So Peter's learning. His knowledge is expanding. Not just Peter, but the rest of the apostles. But our focus is upon Peter. And then Jesus goes on to say, it's not the fact that you eat with unwashed hands that defiles the soul. It is what comes out of the heart that defiles the soul. And the book of Mark adds this in Mark chapter 7 and verse 19 that at this point, Jesus declared all foods to be clean. I had missed that before. I know that he declared them all to be clean to Peter when he was upon the housetop in Acts chapter 9 and 10, and he went to Cornelius, the Gentile, but it is here that Jesus declared all foods clean, according to Mark. We're continuing to build up to the question. Jesus now goes to the city of Tyre, which is in the Gentile world. And a woman comes to him and she says, please, please, please heal my daughter. And Jesus says, you don't give the child's food to the street dogs. That sounds like a reprimand. But the woman said, no, but the house dogs, the puppy dogs, do eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And Jesus, Jesus was marveled at her faith. Your faith is great. It shall be done for you. And Peter sees this. He then returns to Galilee, and a big crowd gathers around about him. <laughs> and everybody that they bring to him that is sick, he heals them. Now that's not like modern day healers. Modern day healers will have people standing at the door who say, uh, I'm sorry, you can't get in the line to be healed. How do I know this? Because of a personal experience that a friend of mine had numerous times. Again and again he would go and they would say, no, you can't get in the line because his problem was too big. There were no problems too big for Jesus. No problems too big. Continuing on, he also feeds people again. And it says in Matthew 15, 37 and 38 that he fed 4,000 men plus women and children. We have no idea how big that crowd was. But he miraculously fed them. Where was Peter? Right there. So Peter is going from the time that he walked on the water and failed as he's learning more and more about Jesus. And Jesus is getting ready to ask them the question. 
Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? <laughs> I'd like to phrase that a different way. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? He cannot be just one thing to you. He cannot be just Savior. He cannot be just Savior. And yet that's what a lot of people want from Jesus, and that's it. He is Lord. He is Master. He is King. He is Lawgiver. He is High Priest. He is deity, and I'll not go any further. But when it comes to this lesson, the lesson is not so much what Peter said, but the lesson is, who is Jesus to me? Who is He in my life? What impact does that have? Do I feel free to change His word? Do I feel free to ignore what He says? Who is Jesus to us? And the text says concerning the feeding of the 4,000, they ate and were filled. Interestingly enough, these leaders had been seeing some of the miracles that Jesus had been doing. And here's what they do. They come to Jesus and they say, we want to see a sign from heaven. Yes, you fed 4,000 people. Yes, you healed the leprous. Yes, you healed the lame. Yes, you healed the blind. Yes, you raised Lazarus from the dead. But we want to see a sign from heaven. You know, you get to the point where you think, there would never be enough for those people to believe to the point that they will obey. To the point that they will obey. Jesus says, a sign will not be given except the sign of Jonah. And he was actually talking about the resurrection. He says, you are going to see the sign of all signs. I have been given the power to raise myself from the dead. I have been given the power to raise myself from the dead. No human being was ever given that power by God. And then Jesus talks to His apostles. He says, don't accept the leaven of the Pharisees. And their first thought was, He was talking about bread. But what Jesus really meant was, in Matthew 16 and 12, not the leaven of bread, but the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees which can permeate and had permeated Judaism and had corrupted much of Judaism just like human traditions and things being brought over from the Mosaic Law into Christianity have permeated much of Christianity. Much of it. And one of the things we're really dealing with does Jesus have the right and the power and the responsibility greater than Moses and the prophets so that He is the ultimate, only lawgiver from God? Is He the one? And then He goes to Bethsaida. He's going to be working his way north from Bethsaida. And in Bethsaida, 
he heals a man who is blind. Peter's with him. He's seeing all of this. He's seeing all of it. Now, when he goes into the area of Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi is, is the home of that area's paganism, pagan worship. Uh, I got permission from the people who made this. You have the cave entrance, which is called the Gate of Hades. You have the Temple of Augustus, the Court of Pan. Uh, Pan is that half goat, half human god. Uh, you have the Temple of Zeus. You have the Upper Tomb. You have the Lower Tomb. And out in front of the Lower Tomb, you have the Dancing Goats. And the worship of goats was part of their, their sacrifice. But I want to share something else with you that may be a little bit surprising. And that is Caesarea Philippi is only five miles east of Dan, which was the seat of idol worship for the northern tribes of Israel. He's right in the middle of Jewish paganism and Gentile paganism. Right in the heart of that country. Dan, they worship the golden calf. Five miles away, all of these temples to paganism. And what does Jesus do when he's there? Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, perhaps resurrected, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So there were people who were thinking, yes, he is a prophet. Yes, he is from God. Yes, he can do some of the miracles that those prophets of the Old Testament could do. Yes, he is a teacher, as some of those prophets of the Old Testament were. But folks, that's not enough. That's not enough to give a new law. That's not enough to pay for the sins of mankind. That's not enough to establish a new kingdom. It's just not enough. And so, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ. That word means one who has been anointed. Anointed by God to be prophet and priest and king and lawgiver and those other things I mentioned a while ago. Given the divine appointment for that purpose. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, or Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What are the implications? What are the implications if Jesus really is the Son of God? And interestingly enough, Matthew continues to give us those implications. Very, very interesting. Let's go and take a look. Number one, I am going to build my church. Well, how do you have the right to do it? I'm the Son of God. I say unto you that you're Peter and on this rock, not the rock of Peter. Folks, the church has never been built on a human being. Even Israel wasn't built on Moses. It was built upon God. Moses was just a lawgiver. But Moses was a servant in the house of God. Jesus is a son in the house of God. So the first thing he says after Peter says, you're the son of God, he says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades, death, will not overpower it. Look at Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, this is Jesus, a tested stone, not Peter, 
a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it, not Peter, but Jesus, <coughs> he who believes in it will not be disturbed. Secondly, he says, death will not defeat my church. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Hades is a grave. I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, but folks, if Jesus doesn't come again, you're going to Hades. Because the word Hades simply means the realm of dead people. It is not hell, not eternal punishment, not punishment. It's simply the realm of the dead. And if the Lord doesn't come again, I'm going to Hades one day. And so are you. But death will not defeat the church. Why? Because there is a resurrection. That's why death can't defeat the church. It's because when I die, I will live again. And when you die, you will live again. And who has the right and the power to say you will live again? It isn't Moses, it isn't Abraham, it's not David, it is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And this is what Jesus is doing based upon that truth. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We call it the res resurrection. The next thing he says to Peter I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven he's not talking about the fact that Peter's standing at heaven's gate that's what a lot of people think he's talking about the fact that Peter is going to preach and use the key to the king what is the key to the kingdom what's well, the gospel it's the gospel of Christ. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter used the gospel key to open up the door of salvation and Christianity to the Jewish world. And in Acts chapter 10, he used that same key, the gospel of Christ, to open up the door of salvation to the Gentiles. Peter was privileged to preach the gospel first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, just as Jesus had promised him on that occasion. What right does Jesus have to tell Peter, you can open up the kingdom to the Jews and the Gentiles? Moses didn't have that right, but the Son of God does. But that's not all. From that time, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. No one who was ever raised from the dead raised themselves. But Jesus will. He said, I have been given the authority to lay my life down and to take it up again. Who could do that? Son of God. Moses couldn't do it. Elijah couldn't do it. None of those of the Old Testament could do it. Peter couldn't do it. John couldn't do it. But the Son of God could and did do it. Next, he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's a sermon right there, isn't there? Who has the authority to say something like that? Moses did not say it. He didn't say, take up your cross and follow me. He could say, take up your cross and follow God. 
Why can Jesus say it? Because He is God. He is God. He is deity. And based upon the reality of His deity and the truthfulness of His deity, He can tell you, you better pick up your cross and you better follow Me. Because if you want to be saved, that's the only way it's going to happen. And Bill, that goes for you too. What right does he have to say that? Because he is deity, the Son of God. But he's not done. Here's another implication of the fact that he's the Son of God. The Son of Man, talking about himself, is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Final judgment. Who's your final judge? <coughs> Moses? Who's your final judge? Zeus? Who's your final judge? Your kids? Your parents? No. They have no power regarding final judgment. But the Son of God does. And He is going to judge us not according to our feelings, not according to our sincerity, but according to His Word and our deeds in response to His Word. And that's not all. He's not done talking about the implications based upon the truth that He is the Son of God. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Some of you, if you were there on that occasion, I want you to get this. If you were there when He said that, He's telling you that the church is going to be established, that's His kingdom, before you're all dead. Now some of you may be dead but not all of you. And incidentally, we do know one who was there who was dead when the church was established. Do you remember his name? Judas? Judas died and never saw the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost. But because he is the Son of God, he could say without reservation, some of you who are standing here listening to what I say right now, you are going to see the kingdom of God come with power. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the Pentecost when the church that I came to build is established. Do you remember that's where all this started? He was identified as being the Son of God and the first thing He says I will build my church. My church. Not church as plural. Not church A, B, C, and D. I'm going to build my church. What right do you have to say that? Because I'm the Son of God, Jesus would say. That's some of the implications that bring us to the very title of this lesson. Who is Jesus to me? There are people who daily slough off the Son of God. They account Him unworthy to be heard, unworthy to be followed, unworthy to be obeyed, a nuisance, old-fashioned, out of date, having failed to keep up with the times, and understanding that the world really is different now than it was back then. And that our needs are different. And our culture is different. Therefore, we need a new gospel. We need one that's just love and mercy and no commandments and laws. Because commandments and laws, 
they're just rules and regulation, and that's not what counts anyway. It's what I feel in my heart. And that has been sold, polished, canonized to the point that that is the primary plea of much of Christianity. Jesus put it plainly. He is the author, the source of salvation for all who obey Him. And that's plain. We understand it. Our world doesn't like it. And Jesus promised that the world wouldn't like it. And Jesus promised that it would be tough to obey it. But He says, I will help you. You walk with me. And we're going to go back to Peter. When Peter failed, and he asked for help, he did not look back at the boat. He looked to Jesus. So when we fail, and we know we have violated the will of God, perhaps we brought in traditions from men, don't have book, chapter, and verse. Perhaps we brought in things from the Old Testament, not sanctified by the blood of Jesus, sanctified by animal blood, corrupting the blood of Jesus when it's brought in. We turn away from human traditions. We turn away from the law of Moses as our guide in matters of faith and practice. And we do what Jesus said. Take up your cross and follow me. So who is Jesus to me? Savior? King? High priest? Lawgiver? Judge, Lord, brother, mediator, shepherd, light, or does it begin here? He is the Son of God. He is deity. God. And here's the point of today's lesson. <coughs> How is that truth affecting my life and the way I live? That's where it winds up. does not wind up with our being able to say, I don't see any harm in it. Does it have book, chapter, and verse? I don't see what that matters. Does it have book, chapter, and verse? But I feel that I'm saved in my heart. Do you have book, chapter, and verse? Why book, chapter, and verse? Because those are the words of the Father. Not Jesus. Not the Holy Spirit the Father. Those are the words the Son of God brought to us. No wonder Matthew continued with some of the implications of who Jesus was. But I will tell you this. Peter still didn't get it all together. That's next Sunday's lesson. Because in the very next chapter, we have evidence, point blank evidence, Peter still didn't fully get it. Lessengers, don't you like that guy, Peter? Sometimes you get frustrated with him, the way he acts, and yet, Jesus made him a promise once he reinstated him in the book of John. He says, Peter, you're going to die for me. You're going to be faithful to the point you will die for me. Are you
are you a member of the body of Christ? You see, the head saves the body. And his body is his church, according to Scripture. Have you been faithful in his body if you're a Christian? Do you call yourself a devoted, dedicated, seeking the kingdom of God first person? So back to our question. How is that truth affecting my life and the way that I live? 